we published a paper in uh, the journal Nature Medicine, which is called Predicting Conversion to Wet Age-Related Macular De Degeneration Using Deep Learning. I think that this is something really big, actually, and something that I'm uh, really, really proud of and really excited about. Essentially, what we've done is we've used the latest form of artificial intelligence, a technique called deep learning. We use it to predict the development of wet AMD in the good eye of patients. We've built an early warning system for the commonest cause of blindness in the UK and Europe and in many other uh, regions around the world. Let's just break that down a tiny bit. You, you're talking about sort of development from dry to wet. But why, why in the good eye? So this is patients who have already developed wet in one eye. They're receiving treatment. And we predict the development of wet, if it's going to happen, because it doesn't happen in all patients. But if it's going to happen, we try to predict it, uh, the imminent conversion. So that means six months ahead of time. And the reason why we've chosen this is for two kind of main reasons. The first reason is because if you're a patient and suppose you've lost sight in one eye, you, your vision is down in one eye, um, that's, n that's nowhere near as bad as losing sight in the good eye. And that's the thing, of course, the patients are really stressed about. The other key aspect is that this is this unique situation where if you're receiving injections in one eye for a wet AMD, you're typically coming in every four to six weeks. And as standard in most eye hospitals, when you come in, they'll do an OCT scan of both eyes. It's a, almost a unique situation where we have like lots of relatively normal or early scans, and then it converts over time. So you've kind of got a, a virtual time machine that you can look at data from the past. That's the unique situation because you're, you know, deep learning is so powerful, but Imagine a situation where you wanted to do something similar with, um, you know, something in the brain, like predicting a stroke or something like that. You're not going to be in a situation where you have lots and lots of MRI scans from a patient before they develop a stroke. But the fact that we have two eyes and one of them can get affected first means that we're in that unique position for, the, for these patients. What were your results? I mean, what, what did you find? I mean, how well, how good are you at detecting this? In a subset of patients, so in about 30 to 40 percent of patients who are receiving injections in one eye, we can predict with very high specificity whether they will develop wet AMD in their good eye within the next six months. It's by no means everybody, but it's just in, in that 30 to 40 percent of patients, we can really begin to target this. I mean, I guess it's tricky because there's no preventative treatment. I guess you're not going to be going in and injecting those eyes. So that's already what we're beginning to think about. Now, the, the thing is that <clears throat> there's, there has already been a number of clinical trials in the U.S., uh, one of them called the PRO-CON trial and one of them called the um, PREVENT trial, where they actually looked at doing quarterly injections of anti-VEGF in the good eye before the development of wet AMD. And the problem was that those trials were small and essentially they just, they didn't, they didn't really do much risk stratification of the patients. So they just enrolled patients and, you know, so, uh, uh, tried to see if it would work, and it didn't really uh, work, essentially. Now, our idea is that by identifying those patients that are the highest risk, we could move towards doing a clin another clinical trial where we use, uh, where we explore preventative treatment. So, for example, that could be with anti-VEGF injections, um, or it could be with a new treatment, like some of the long-acting uh, depot systems that are being developed. Or it could be with some entirely new novel treatment like gene therapy or something like that in the future. So the key point is using AI to identify those patients most likely to develop this condition. And so it allows you to do you know, more accurate and more efficient clinical trials and hopefully be more successful looking even further ahead to the future i mean could you extend that time frame do you think that that six months 
Did you look into moving it to a year? In the supplementary material of the paper, we do show our results for three months, for six months, for 12 months, and for 24 months. Now, our focus was on the six months, but we it is at the back of our minds that we're interested in longer periods of time. I think it depends on the setting that it's used. So in a hospital setting, when you're in front of a retina specialist, you probably want to have something that's quite short, that's clinically actionable. Whereas in an optometry setting, I could imagine that maybe you want a longer term uh, predictor for some of your patients. In terms of the practical aspects, um, at the moment, this is still a system that is that will be used in the context of clinical trials. So it's not something that can actually be used yet in actual direct patient care. And cons- so, you know, some other considerable work would be required for, say, an optometrist in practice to be able to just take an OCT scan and click a button and then get this prediction. Now, once that's done, it should be it should be very straightforward. It would probably involve the OCT scan being sent up to the cloud, and then a few seconds later, it, you know, something would appear on the screen that gives the risk of converting or not converting. Do you have an idea of when this concept, you know, is it five years, 10 years before you think it might be able to be more commercially available? The next steps for this are to plan a clinical trial that uses this algorithm to identify high-risk patients and recruit into the trial. And then the trial itself will involve some sort of preventative treatment. I think that's the next step in hopefully in 2021. I think it's going to be very well suited to that because um, in a clinical trial, you can control exactly what type of OCT device is used. You can make sure that the images are always of a certain quality and you can have a lot of human oversight. And so in that setting, I think AI is going to be really powerful. And I think it would it would only be subsequent to that that you could it would actually be in clinical practice. So it's a little bit further down the road. So that this collaboration with DeepMind, this is something that you want you see going for for a long time then. This is the long long haul. We've been working with um, DeepMind since 2016. And then um, in the last year or so, um, we've been working, uh, you know, very closely with Google Health. And so, uh, you know, we've been working with DeepMind on a lot of the basic research. And then increasingly, we're, we're working with Google Health on actually getting something that can be used in millions of people. Do you think that research like this will have more importance in the age of the pandemic where we're, you know, trying to reduce clinical time? I think that um, that research like this is going to be a necessity in the time of the global pandemic. I think that, you know, the reality is I'm expecting that until there's a vaccine in place, there will be an extended period of social distancing. And so in that context, I think that uh, the role of community optometrists will become even more powerful than it already is, because I think what we need to do is put we need to have more OCTs in the community and we need to have the, the, the technical infrastructure to be able to link those uh, community optometry practices with hospitalized services in a more sophisticated way. And then we need to have AI on top of that to really help manage the system. And I think it's something that's it's, it's not, it's not going to be a luxury. I think it's something that will have to happen in the coming, the coming months. Anything else you feel we haven't touched on? Anything else you want to throw in? You know, one of the things that I I didn't get a chance to say to you, but I really wanted to mention here is that the joint first author on this paper is is someone called Rina Chopra. And Rina is an an optometrist, um, you know, at Moorfields. And um, I think more than anybody, she is responsible for this paper. Um, She... Um, like, she, like people don't know this yet, but I think she, you know, she could be one of the leading experts in AMD in the world. And, um, you know, she's relatively young, so maybe people underestimate her, but she is amazing. And so, um, 
you know, I really would like to highlight um, that your her huge contribution to this work. 